Hi, everyone. Hi, hello. So, good evening. Um, on behalf of America Society, we would like to welcome you tonight to discussions on Mini Evans and Artur Bispo de Rosario program. Uh, we will present the following two panel discussions the drawings of Mini Evans, a chess game with Bispo de Rosario. We are pleased to collaborate on this program with Outsider Art Fair, opening in New York City this Thursday. There will be also a reception after the second panel. And yes, we would like to thank the Outsider Art Fair team, Andrew and Sofia, um, for the organization of tonight's event. We would also like to thank tonight's panelists, please, Esther Adler, Nathan Kernan, Elizabeth Penton, and Wayne Evans, as well as Javier Tejes and Edward Gomez. Uh, lastly, I would like actually to remind you that there will be a Q&A after both panels. So please, if there are, you know, if you have any questions, keep this for the end. And yes, I will leave you with Andrew and Sofia. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. And uh, we're, we're really grateful uh, to the American Society for hosting our OAF talks. Um, it's such a magnificent venue. Uh, it's a little over 10 years now since we started OAF Talks, and I'm enormously proud of it. Uh, in 2013, it was sort of an interesting moment in the art world. The curator of the Venice Biennale, Massimiliano Gioni, had selected an artwork owned by the American Folk Art Museum called the Encyclopedic Palace to name his uh, exhibition at the Venice Biennale. And our first talk was organized by Valerie Russo and included Massimiliano with uh, Ralph Rugoff, the director of the Hayward Gallery, and Daniel Bauman, who had curated the Carnegie International and is now the director of uh, the Kunsthalle Zurich. And it was a moment where many outsider artists were selected for the Venice Biennale, and there was more and more conversation about their integration into the art world conversation and how influential they are. And now, 10 years later, I think it's safe to say that uh, the power and the influence of self-taught artists is uh, being felt more and more. Um, we've had tremendous panelists, including we've had a Nobel Prize winner at our talks. We've had artists like Marilyn Minter and Lonnie Holly. We even had a 99-year-old hero of the French Resistance, Daniel Cordier, at one of our talks. So I think it's a great history, and uh, I just want to thank you all for coming again and enjoy tonight's talks, and I want to introduce you to our director, Sophia Lanous. Hi, thank you everyone for being here. I just wanted to remind you that the Outsider Art Fair uh, opens next Thursday at the Metropolitan Pavilion till Sunday, so we hope you all see you all there. Um, I will introduce um, our panelists. So Esther Adler, she's curator in the department, uh, department of Drawings and Prints at the Museum of Modern Art, New York. Um, Wayne Evans is the great-grandson of Minnie Evans. Uh, Nathan Kernan is a writer execu and executor of the state of his grandmother, Nina Howell Starr, um, the photographer who introduced Minnie's works to New York's audiences and curated her 1975 exhibition at the Whitney Museum. Elizabeth Penton has been teaching non-Western art and anthropology for over 30 years. Currently, she's working on the manuscript Mini Evans, A Beautiful Light, and is also on the production team of the documentary that we will see the trailer after uh, this talk. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, our panelists, and see you at the Outsider Art Fair. Thank you so much, Sophia, and thanks to everyone here for, for joining us. Uh, my name is Esther Adler, and as Sophia said, I'm a curator at the Museum of Modern Art. I am also certainly the person on this stage who knows the least about Minnie Evans. Um, so as you can imagine, I'm very excited to hear um, from our panelists as well. What I do know about Minnie Evans comes from an extraordinary group of seven drawings that we have in our collection at the museum, all of which were a gift to us in 1997 by um, Nina Howell-Starr. Uh, Nathan's grandmother. And it's an extraordinary group because it really 
shows the many different ways in which Evans was working over the course of time. Uh, what I learned in preparing for this panel was that these works in 97 were not, in fact, the first engagement MoMA had. Oh, this is, of course, my uh, my favorite green animal from 1963. These works were not the first engagement at the museum with Minnie Evans. Uh, and her work came to us in a very typical fashion via the members' penthouse, which is where a large number of self-taught artists, including Joseph Yoakum were first introduced to MoMA audiences. And here you can see um, the very old loam form filled out by Ms. Starr, um, allowing us to show nine works by Minnie Evans in an exhibition just titled A Landscape, which paired her with artists like Alex Katz, uh, Mary Heilman, David Hockney. Um, it was really kind of a fascinating group. And then this lovely letter from Ms. Starr to Pierre Apraxine, who at that time was organi organizing those exhibitions about um, how do Buffet loved Minnie Evans' work, and she was excited to hear further um, further interest and reactions to the exhibition. So, of course, that was 1972. Little happens until 1997 when these works become um, part of the museum's collection. Um, they are, however, shown elsewhere in New York in 1975 at the Whitney Museum, which gives... Um, Evans a solo exhibition and which also acquires two of her first works that she, as she calls them um, given around the same time as that exhibition so um, with that kind of intro to uh, Evans's work in um, New York institutions I thought we would turn it over to someone who knew the artist herself Wayne Evans so <laughs> Wayne you're up <laughs> And when Wayne, you're, Wayne, uh, you're Minnie's great grandson, great grandson. and how many, ch can you do a little bit of family tree for us? How many uh, kids did she have? She had, she had three children. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Here, now? Right, okay. She had three children, um, my uncle Elisha, my uncle David. And my, she had three children. <laughs> my uncle Elisha, who, who lived in New York, I think he passed away in New York, and my uncle Dave, who lived in Detroit, and then my grandfather, who was George Evans, who she... I'm sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Well, I got you, I got you. Uh, hey, I'm used to teaching sixth grade, uh, sixth grade students, so I'm not don't well with the end of the so I'm like, you get here. Um, um, my grandfather, who was, I guess he was in charge of all of her artwork, basically. Um, we, I lived with my grandmother growing up. Um, for some reason, I don't know why we lived there, but we, uh, we often lived there um, from time to time. Um, this was like, like the early, I'm gonna give a story about you, how I met Miss Starr, and which, was so, which was so funny to me, but I think about it now, it wasn't, it wasn't funny at the time. Um, I, was, I think I was in first grade, first grade, and I just coming from school, I had just gotten off the school bus, my brother and I, and as we normally do, we would typically do, we would run home, run, run to the porch, and burst into the house and everything. And so, this year, the year 69, 69 70, um, was the first year of integration. So in, in the area where we lived, there were no white people. There were only <laughs> my family members and my church members and all that. So um, getting off the school bus one day, I'm running into the house. And as I burst into the house, there's this, this white lady on the chair. And I, I remember just standing still um, looking because I thought for some reason I had done something bad at school. And, Ms., and Ms., she was from the school. I, know, I don't know why I made it about me, but it was all about me. And that I, that I was in trouble. I mean, it was, it, I was just terrified of Ms. Star for a long period of time because of that situation, but I got to know her quite well afterwards. And we, who was a, a, a wonderful lady. I, I, um, she would come down periodically throughout the years. And I think they met somewhere prior to my being born in the early 60s somewhere that, that time, 61 when they met, and I didn't come along to 60, 62. 62. I didn't come along to somewhere, in the, well, somewhere after that. I came along and, um, and like I said, I've gotten to know Mr. R uh, uh, quite well, um, coming back and forth to visit with my grandmother. I, and, and actually, I remember the, the exhibit that they were said. I think that was the reason why she was, uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's one of the reasons why she was in town, but I, I got to know her quite well throughout the years. and. I don't know. She was, just, she was just such a wonderful woman. My grandmother, on the other hand, was an awesome lady. I'm telling my great grandmother. We often refer to her as Mama. There were um, tons of grandchildren, and for some reason, we all lived there. I don't know why we were there. We were just there, you know, at, at that point. And Mama, she stayed. Mama and Mama Hun, which was her mother. So um, 
I grew up in the house with, with Mama Manning and with her mother also. And she passed away at the age of 107 or something like that when I was in high school. And Mama passed away with, uh, my, after my first year of college, I think in 87. But we grew up in the house, we grew up in the house with them, you know, getting up, getting up in the mornings, going to early gardens, take, taking, her to, taking her to work, because she was working at that time at, at, early, at early gardens. And you know, she was just a wonderful person. She would tell stories by the dozens, you know, stories of her childhood when she was growing up. And when her mother, her mother we, who we call Mama Hun, would often talk about different things that I, I had no idea what she was talking about. But it, it, was, just, it, was, just, it was a great, you, you, you had to have known her. You really had to have known that she was, she was one of the sweetest people, one of the sweetest people you ever would meet. She loved people. She, I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to ex explain. You, you, it's like a, I don't know, I'm getting nervous now. But, no, it's yeah. She was just a wonderful, wonderful individual that just, that just loved everyone. She taught us a lot about loving people, and, and, and that, was, that was just her main thing, love, love your fellow man, love your, love your neighbors. And that was just, that was just her, that name of the game with her. I Which think you see a lot of that in the work, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah was, was art a part of your life? Like, were you aware that she was making so much actually, art that it was so important to her? I, she was. She always. Well, before I was born, she was an artist, but she was always drawing. Always drawing. It was like something she did, and there was nothing really, really. I wouldn't say at that time. At that time in my life, it was. It wasn't something that was really special. It was something that, that Mama did. You know, she was always drawing. When she was at, when she was at um, L.A., she was drawing. When she was at home, she was, she was drawing. On weekends, she was drawing. She was just always, 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 always drawing. So it, it wasn't special. I, and I do remember um, oftentimes when I would go to school, I would take some artworks. And I, I would just give it to my teachers. Because my grandma, she was giving it. I was like, I have to, for my teachers. And I just gave, I just gave it all away. You know, I mean, ton, ton, tons of it away. No, nah, I regret that now. But, you know, <laughs> what can you do? But, yeah, she was just... Such a, wonder, such a wonderful, wonderful individual, you know, who, who, who impacted my life a, a great deal. And was there art in your house? Like, did she hang her art where she, you lived? She or? did not. Oddly enough, she did not. It, it, was, it was everywhere, mind you. It was just, you know, everywhere. But what, there, was, there wasn't anything that was hung on the walls or, or anything along those lines. It was just, I don't know. It was just, it was just she had a very, it was a very big house. It was like a... Um, a larger version of a shotgun type house, if you know what I mean. You know, you walk in the living room, three uh, living room, dining room, kitchen, and three bedrooms on the side. Very big rooms, and I can still see the rooms in my mind, in my mind's eye. But there were no pictures ever hung in in the house. Don't know why it wasn't, but there was no picture. But, but they were all hanging. They were all all around. You know, on chairs and on on, on easels. And, No, no, Liz, you want to turn on your mic yeah. and, and join us? Oh, no. I'd also love yeah. to hear, I know that you two have, um, have a connection as it's well from Wilmington. Yeah, this is cool, this is cool lady. Um, I think that um, many had a, a group of paintings and drawings that she carried with her for a long time, probably before yeah. you were born. Right, right, right. And I think she called it her angel book, is that right, Wendy? Um, anyway, I was just wondering if you. I don't remember okay. the angel. Yeah, I mean, she would take them with her when she went okay. everywhere to the grocery everywhere. Oh. No. But okay, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I jumped in. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I think it's and, great. I mean, and she could have, you know, at that at that time, I was, you know, because yeah. I wasn't paying much attention to what Mama did. Mama, she was just being Mama, you know, doing doing what she did best, just drawing. Um, I mean, she. I mean, she worked through the day, you know, mm -hmm. the first few years of my life. I think she retired, and retired mm -hmm. from early gardens in like 70, mm -hmm. 74 mm -hmm. or something like that. So she worked every day. And she would come home and she, again, she, would, she, I mean, she wouldn't cook. I think my great grandmother did most of the cooking at that time. Mm -hmm. And my parents were somewhere. I don't know where they were. Mm -hmm. They were just somewhere around. But yeah, she was just, she was just a, a, such a, I keep saying this, but a, a wonderful, wonderful person. I, can, I cannot stress that enough, stress that enough of mm -hmm. how. Type of person that she's she generous, yeah, of spirit. generous person, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we were all there. We were, we were arguing who's going to sleep with Mama. You know, when we all stayed, like they were like they were like thirty some grandchildren. I think close to thirty some grandchildren, and we were all stay. We were all stay there. So who's going to sleep with Mama? And who's going to sleep with Mama? And who's going to do this? And who's going to do that? And that's just the, the life that we, we grew up. With. We were just a very cohesive family. We were all always there for one another. We've always been that been that way. And I know that the church in the community in Wilmington was also kind of um, a central Saint spot. St. Matthew, right. Well, there were two churches, St. Matthew and Pilgrim Rest, which, is, which are still both lo located on the um, Wrightsville Avenue. Wrightsville Avenue area mm -hmm. of Wrightsville Beach. We still attend that church to, to this day. Gotcha. We, we have in Wilmington, I do either way. 
And Liz, I think you have a connection with that church as well, yeah? Yes, um, Wayne and I have a connection. Um, we were born into very different circumstances, but I said raised um, and molded by the same hands. Um, I grew up in the white part of town um, on Country Club Road, and my parents, my mother was very young when I was born, and my parents hired a woman who was from um, the Wrightsville Sound Community Church um, to work in our home, which she did for 40 years, and raised me and my brother and my mother too. And Wayne and I didn't know each other until this past year, mm -hmm. and we, we realized that um, we were both deeply connected to this woman. Who, she lived Georgie Franks right mm -hmm. next door to St. Matthew and was a big part of this tiny community. And Wayne and I were just like yeah. crying because it's, you know, such a great she was such an important, formative force on right. both of us in different circumstances during, right. anyway. Right. Yeah. Right. Correct. Okay. Correct. And Liz, how do you come to Minnie Evans' work? Um, so, I have this deep personal connection and um, through Miss Georgie Franks to the community. But always growing up in Wilmington, um, we knew of Minnie Evans' pictures mm -hmm. because uh, she would barter with them for um, doctors and lawyers, you know, especially she got um, well known. Mm -hmm. And like Wayne said, uh, people just gave them to each other, you know, give, give them away. away. And I mean, they're in the attics in Wilmington. I can't tell you how many were going to be found in the next few years. But um, so I was always aware, especially driving before seat belts, this dates me a little bit, when we would drive to the beach in a station wagon, everybody's hanging out of the uh, car, we would go by Early Gardens where um, Evans was drawing in and had these tacked up to the side of the gatehouse. Yeah. Um, and should I just keep yammering? Sure, and I know, I mean, Liz, you're the one I think at the moment who's quite um, close to the work based on research you've been doing. Yeah. And I, I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the institution at which you've been doing that research and yes. how you ended up doing that. Sure, sure. So um, I just have, I, I went to school and um, uh, have always had a deep interest in art and culture and in particularly visionary art. Um, I have a degree in anthropology and um, Two years ago, I finally got the chance to uh, have space in my life, and I always wanted to do a deep dive into Evan's work in terms of form, um, putting aside the story of her life, which is quite fascinating, putting aside how we, you know, is it a green animal? Is it from the Bible? What does it mean? They're angels. Are they eyes of God? You know, putting all of that aside and really doing a disciplined analysis of the forms of her work. And so the Cameron Art Museum, let me just give a giant shout out. This is our local museum in Wilmington, um, has a slide archive of over 400 of her work. And Anne Brennan, the director of the Cameron Art Museum, told this story. I'll try to relay it in just a few sentences, and you help me, Nathan, if I get something wrong. But um, when um, Minnie Evans passed away, you know, her work was already well known in New York and in a lot of places. And so people would, and, and Wayne too, you let me know if, I, if I'm going off course here. But um, uh, a lot of collectors came down and, you know, were so, um, uh, get to, to give their condolences and is there anything we can do to help with the funeral right. and oh, we would love to have this picture and we'll give you $20 or whatever. And- That was mm -hmm. St. John's, I got it at the time. Yes, it? it was, yeah. It was the Cameron Art Museum was previously- St. John's, yeah. right. And the director, his name was Ren Brown mm -hmm. and um, so um, George mm -hmm. came to the director of the art museum and said these people are here and they're asking and Wren um, you know very tactfully said um, George if, if if it's okay with you we would love to um, to hold on to this these works you know get them out from under the mattresses and out right. from everywhere they are and um, let us hold on to them and in the meantime he took one piece to um, um, a prominent family in Wilmington who later uh, 
built the Cameron Art Museum. And in just kind of this one fell swoop, um, the, the value of Evan's work just skyrocketed because everybody knew the value and didn't want these to just go, you know, for nothing right. out from the under the family. And so um, at so the St. John's Art Gallery housed the works and took slides of them. And I mean a few of the pieces have come to you now. Um, and uh, so this is we think the largest collection in one place of so many of her works. And so it was that um, in uh, about a year and a half or two years ago, uh, they gave me, I was about to throw away my slide projector because I was clearing stuff out. And it's like, the, who needs this old fashioned machine, you know? And then, um, boom, you know, now I needed it to, to use. And we are electronically archiving these works. But shall I keep going? Well, actually, I thought I wanted to bring Nathan into the conversation now that we're talking about the kind of this legacy keeping and how it is that Minnie Evans' work has been available for us to study. Um, so Nathan, you're the grandson of Nina Howell's star, and I wondered if you could tell us how how she came to know and um, become so close with Minnie Evans. Just up. <clears throat> uh, is that me? Hello? Okay. Um, I'm not too good at speaking off the cuff, so I wrote some things down for you. Um, uh, my grandmother, Nina, was a photographer, and her involvement with Minnie came out of that. In the 1950s, she was living in Gainesville, Florida, where her husband taught in the English department at the University of Florida. Every year they would drive up to their summer place in New Hampshire and Nina would photograph the hand-painted signs along the way, especially in the south. These photographs she exhibited as a series, which she called contemporary roadside folk art. At that time, folk art, so-called, was thought to be a purely 19th century genre and the idea that there could be contemporary living folk artists was radical. Occasionally, she learned of an individual artist of interest, and she would seek to meet them. In 1961, at the age of 58, she entered the graduate program at the university <clears throat> to get her MFA. Her teacher and thesis advisor was Jerry Yulesman, who became a close friend. This was his first year teaching at the university, and Nina, his first graduate student, was older than his own mother. He taught his students to ask themselves when looking at a photograph, what is it? And then, what else is it? His own photographic work employs multiple exposures to create surrealistic, dreamlike worlds. Perhaps Nina's familiarity with his work prepared her to some degree for minis. But so also did her love for medieval art, Italian primitives, and many other art traditions she had studied and collected images of in voluminous scrapbooks. In 1961, a fellow graduate student showed her some crayon drawings by Minnie Evans, thinking they would interest her because of her roadside folk art project. Nina confessed later that she didn't know what to make of them at first. The bright, saturated colors blinded her but her documentarian instincts kicked in, and she decided to photograph them. It was while she was actually in the dark room, printing the drawings in black and white, that the graphic power of Minnie's images struck her. As she became more and more excited about the work, she considered making Minnie the subject of her MFA thesis. And in early 1962, she decided to visit her. That visit, which Nina has written about, was a life-changing experience for both women. Nina did not write her thesis on Minnie, but she did write several papers on her work, interviewed her uh, on tape many times, tried to locate, photograph, and catalog every work she could find, and became her representative in New York once she and her husband moved there in 1964, organizing shows and making sales. And so in many ways, she became, as you just said, the representative for 
um, many Evans in the world that we're kind of currently now in the New York art scene um, in terms of showing her work. Um, I wonder if we, I, I was especially interested in the fact that she organized the exhibition of Evans's work at the Whitney. I wondered if we could skip ahead a little bit and talk about that. <clears throat> yeah, sure. I wasn't, unfortunately, I wasn't here in, in 75 for that show, so I, I never saw it. And she didn't talk to me much about it. Um, I think she was disappointed, maybe, that it didn't get more attention. And it's still not on the Whitney's own website, by the way. <clears throat> uh, apparently, I heard later that there were some black artists and curators who, res who resented that the Whitney was showing an elderly primitive from the South rather than a trained or more mainstream black artist. Um, I didn't know about this then, and she didn't discuss it with me that I can remember. I do know that she was not impressed with Tom Armstrong, the director at the time, when he complained that one of her photographs of Minnie, I think one of the ones up here, was out of focus. As Nina said, he didn't seem to realize that the degree of focus is part of the vocabulary of photography. Um, I wondered if we wanted to open it up to the audience a bit, if anyone had any questions um, for Wayne, for Liz, or for Nathan. Yes? I just wanted to ask you what makes Minnie Evans' work outsider art, perhaps, other than maybe the fact that she didn't have formal art lessons? Is there anything going on psychologically or... Uh, some of the work is very identifiable, other is a little bit more mysterious. So I just wanted to know how you, why you put her into that category of outsider art. Sure, I guess um, what I can say as, as someone working in the field of modern and contemporary right now is that all of these categories are incredibly contested. Um, I think often you need a starting point to talk about someone and because there are these existing categories of outsider, of self-taught, um, that it, it's a, it can be a, a place for, for people to begin engaging with the work. But I think that something that all of us share, at least I can say, um, from the pre-panel discussions is that we're most interested in Evans's work as art and her work as an artist, as opposed to necessarily linking her with um, either specific, but Liz, I thought it was fantastic how you said, uh, spoke about this idea of moving beyond the biography to look at the work itself. Um, and Wayne hearing, beyond the idea of categories exactly and Wayne hearing you talk about um, many events both as, like as a person yeah. as well as an artist I think is so important and um, Nathan I think the way that your um, your grandmother became such a champion for her work also speaks to that um, desire to kind of move beyond these specific categories I'll, I'll just say that Barbara Blumink who wrote one of the essays for the the exhibition that the Cameron organized and it traveled quite a bit in in the country uh, said in her essay that Minnie Evans was not outside of anything. She was from a specific uh, community, a specific environment in the South, in the rural South. Um, that was that was her that was her world, and she wasn't. Um, uh, she was within a definite community, not outside of one. Uh, she, it's true that she wasn't. She didn't go to art school, but um, she, her, she had. Yeah, and these are qualities that are certainly shared with lots of artists on view um, at our museum right now. <laughs> um, those identified as self-taught and, and otherwise. So, Josh, did you have? Yeah, what inspired her to put pieces together to make them larger? I know the answer to that. Okay. When, when, <laughs> when um, Nina, when many came to New York and visited Nina and she took her to the Museum of Modern Art and she took her to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in a wheelchair and she was, because she was elderly, I don't know when it was exactly, but she um, was greatly inspired by seeing the paintings in these museums and when she, when she left she said, I'm going to dream tonight to my grandmother, but that was, it was after that that she realized that she wanted to make larger paintings. And she did cut up her early, some of her early drawings and collage them in uh, large panels and made paintings, painting, additional painting around those uh, collaged drawings, the way Lee Krasner also did. I was going to say a really modern and contemporary technique as well, looking back at one's own work and kind of using it to, to move forward into new ideas. In the back? Uh, 
Uh, what, first, what was her inspiration for the type of art that she did? And secondly, has her paintings and the photographs uh, by Nina ever been jointly exhibited together? Liz, do you want to take the first part of that question? Um, the question was, what was her inspiration? Yeah. To, to get well, to the point of her, what I call a sort of a unique style of, yeah. of, of art, you okay. know, what are these representational sure, sure. mean dreams? So, um, yeah, many, um, a, a, and there's there are 300 pages of transcripts of conversation between Nina and many um, archived in the Smithsonian that we have access to her words and explanations. And apparently, um, from childhood, she uh, had visions, saw things, um, and had even kind of optical disturbances that, um, uh, you know, this hasn't really been discussed very much, but um, in my opinion, I have a hypothesis that she experienced aura, um, and that she, you know, a lot of people experience aura, and none of them are geniuses like many Evans in terms of what she did. And so I can speak a little bit to, you know, and you're referencing um, kind of her, what I call her mature period, where everything is really sort of tight and symmetrical and beautifully wrought. And in fact, w with this part, wait, just let's stay with this one. So, um, you know, she ha she did many types of, um, had different types of styles. But, um, for example, in this one, you can see that we have a kind of flatness, even though we have elements from different you know, we got rainbows and starry night all together and a sunrise and a, a lawn. But if we go to the next slide, we can see what is sort of more characteristic and unique about her style, which is this kind of ballooning composition. In, and this is, this is what I've taken as one of my central interests in my work is, um, you know, this is just neat and fantastic and, and like Alice in Wonderland, the more you look, the more it pulls you in. And there's a sense of like concavity, you know, and we get this kind of um, mix of perspectives where things are rushing away, uh, telescoping away, rushing toward, there's kind of concavity of it. And I think it's absolute brilliance. And so her um, mastery of what in my opinion, early on were, you know, optical disturbances and a breakup of the field of vision with her secret weapon of bilateral symmetry. She comes to, you know, this just gorgeous, coherent, awe-inspiring uh, compositions that are quite complicated. So I don't, I didn't answer your question, but. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne, um, could I ask you a little bit about this idea, this sense of visions and dreams? It seemed like something that you were actually quite aware of, and I wondered if, if that was something that was well, common she, she in your family? Often talk, she, she would often talk about dreams and, and um, waking up in strange places and different places where, where, where she initially did not fall asleep, you know, and, and just, I, 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 I the vision, the visions, the visionary. She, she always considers, ugh, sorry about that. Considers herself a visionary artist. So everything she she drew is something that she saw in dreams. It, 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 the way she explained it to us, it was all saw in dreams. And she, whenever she would dream, she would she would do it. She would erase it. I've seen her erase the entire board and start over again. She said, this is not right. This is not right. And one thing I did find very odd is in, in, in watching her paint or draw. She, she always she always. Can you hear it now? Yep. Okay, I'm sorry about that. She always whispered to herself when she was doing it. It was, it was, it was sort of like a whispering sound as she was drawing the, whole, the entire time, um, sort of a breathless type whisper when she drawing. And, like, and I do remember, um, like again, cases where she would start drawing and she would get half of the half of the. Um, the, the canvas covered, you know, she used pencil at first to go ahead and start drawing, and then she would erase it out and say, not right, not right. I just remember that, and she would start again, but she, but she whispered the entire time to herself while she was doing it. So that's kind of a I, fascinating I, part I of the remember, process. So I'm not sure the significance of that or why that happened, but it, I do remember, recall her, yeah. her doing that a lot growing up. And again, it was just a moment, it's something that she just did, <laughs> you know, something yeah. she did, something nothing. That was, Absolutely. That was very, that was, it wasn't something that was, um, that struck us as being sort of 
odd, weird. It was just what was. Right, right. I think we probably have time for one more question, if there is one. Oh, or, or yeah, I also, I'm sorry. I think we, I have already forgotten what this second, you clearly yeah, remember. The answer is yes. Or where, <laughs> or when, but it, it, it has happened, yes. I think there was an exhibition in Vermont, maybe in Brattleboro. That could be, I've come yes. across a that newspaper be, yes. clipping. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think there was a nut. Was there one more question? My question, I guess, is specifically for Mr. Evans. Um, it seems like you have su you had such a personal relationship, and how has it kind of been to see this like attention um, come to this work that you just saw, just around your house and had the experience of seeing someone make it, like the process of drafting and then taking it away and redrafting. Like what has the experience been to be sitting here now, I guess, after just being in, in your house? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question. That's okay. Mm. Ask it again. Let me see. Maybe I, let me think about why you're asking. You want me to ask yeah, it again? Ask yeah, again. Well, I just, you know, if I think of my own, like, grandmother, and I think of them having just had the experience of just watching them make something at their kitchen table, right. and then be in a room like this, I feel like, you know, it, it's got to be, you're such like a, um, a foundation for an oral history of a person at this mm -hmm. point that you just have a really personal relationship with. And what is it kind of like, that shift, I guess? Well, you know, I, think I, I think I understand, okay. understand what you're saying now. I really feel proud of the work that my grandmother did. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm so, so proud of it. You know, and everywhere I go now, whether I'm in Raleigh or here or there, everyone knows my grandmother. Where initially, you know, I guess a few people knew her. And as, as time goes on, she becomes more and more famous. Even in Wilmington, whenever you're around Wilmington, even one of the, one of the schools in Wilmington was named after, named after her. And, and there's diff different parts of Wilmington, um, where, she, where she lived, you know, there's I guess, a marker there that it tells you about it. So everyone knows who my grandmother is now. You know, and it does feel it does feel great whenever you say, "Well, um, my name is Wade Evans." Uh, Minnie Evans' grandson. You, Minnie Evans' grandson. I mean, as far as as far as from home, as far as away as Raleigh, you know, I work part time for Hilton Hotels, and I know guests will come from. Um, we have art conferences, conventions at the, at the hotels, and I would tell that Minnie is my grandmother. And it's like everyone comes to the front desk as if though I'm the artist, but I'm not the artist, you know, <laughs> and, and ask me all sorts of questions about her. But I, I really feel. Um, I'm really, I'm really proud of the work that she's done, and I think everyone in my family is, you know. Um, again, coming from being a child where it was just like an everyday thing, something you say, hey, that's what grandmothers do, what some grandmothers do anyway. Uh, and to now, you know, I'm excited about being here. I'm a little nervous right now, as you all can tell, you know. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about it. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. I, I, feel, I feel proud to be associated with everyone up here on the, on the panel, and this, yeah, this is a great feeling. If that answers your question. It absolutely does. Okay. Thank you. And I think actually this is a great moment um, to talk a little bit about what's in the works for a Mini Evans scholarship at the moment. Um, Liz, I think there's a, well, in addition to your writing, which we'd love to hear a little bit about, I know that there is a film in the works. Yes, um, my good friend Linda Royal um, is in production of a documentary film, a new updated documentary film, um, uh, and there's already been some shooting. We're getting ready to see a five-minute um, uh, example of, of the footage, and um, yeah, Linda, do you want to say a couple of words? Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, so thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, we are currently in production on a documentary film, a feature about Minnie Evans. Um, we started last year. Um, we are about a third of the way there on shooting and fundraising for the film. Um, and I would love to be able to have an opportunity to tell you more about it um, at the reception afterwards. So I'm very honored and grateful to be able to have um, our little five minute preview of what we have accomplished so far in the piece. So thank you. And we're really excited to see it as well. So I think without further ado. Thank you. Uh, 
well, I'm very, very happy uh, for many reasons to be back in American society. I, uh, after the exhibition opened, I had to, to leave to Europe uh, for, for a month, basically, so I'm, I'm back to see the show again. And uh, I'm happy to, to be with the family of American society. Very happy also to collaborate again with the outsider affair. Uh, thank you, Sofia. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, very happy to have Edward Madrid Gomez with us. I came from Madrid to Madrid. What else could you ask, <laughs> you know? Game of chess. Why, why is that a game of chess? I don't know. I have a dream where I was playing chess with Bispo, but that's another story. What I wanted to do was to ask uh, Edward, which is, you know, one of the hardest working men in the field, you know, uh, and do it, yes, as well, <laughs> uh, a question. So hoping that he will not take longer than eight minutes, so that make it like a, like, like the, yes. I will to make it like a, like a chess game or, or maybe the itching, which is 64 uh, squares as well. Okay. Yes. So, <laughs> we'll start from the beginning, of course. You well, know. Let, me, let me just say, por favor. Yeah. Uh, gracias a todos y a todas. Thank you, everyone. And uh, in particular, gracias a las organizadoras de este evento. Thank you to the organizers of this event. And we can't get away without saying also to our Brazilian friends and cousins, obrigado, <laughs> obrigado. Si, si. You know, Brazilian Portuguese is so delicious, all, just saying obrigado is like a meal. So, obrigado. So, the beginning. Si. The beginning was the word. Let's start from the beginning. So, the uh, basic question. Outside the art, our boot, self-taught art, visionary art, I put it at the margins, art, art self-taught, visionary, art of the... It go on and on and, you know, all these yes. discussions right. as well, uh, right. around terms and definitions, you know, that resemble like theological fights of the Middle Age and the Renaissance. Early Renaissance. Uh, could you, what, what would you, how would you explain to uninformed viewer, also as well as informed ones mm -hmm. here, what do you understand by our boot? I've done it. A year ago, in my magazine, Brood Journal, I wrote and published an article which is basically a primer on exactly this topic. What is our brute, outsider art? What is the relationship between these two terms and the history leading up to them? And the more recent term, self-taught art, self art. And so I invite you to look for it. It's, in, it's uh, a free access article, which means that no one, you don't have to be a subscriber to access it. Just type in thebrutejournal.com website, go to the January 2022 page, and you'll find it. We're also going to publish it in March's issue, republish it on the occasion of the Outsider Art Fair, because I think it serves as a good teaching tool. Um, I did have some slides prepared for you that would uh, reinforce the remarks I'm going to make tonight, but unfortunately, for technical reasons, we can't show them. That's all right. So to answer your question, I'm going to give you the history of art boot and outsider art in four minutes or less. All right, very briefly, the phenomenon of art boot has its roots in psychiatric uh, treatment of mentally ill people in Europe going back to the late 1800s. Uh, fast forward into the early 20th century. Freud, Freud's understanding of uh, the psyche of course, that led to the emergence of the very 20th century discipline of psychiatry. And as you know, psychiatrists are medical doctors. They have medical degrees and are able to prescribe medicine. All right. In the time of Freud, and right up until very recent decades, there were not pharmaceuticals, drugs, that were capable of handling many mental illnesses in the way that drugs are now able to handle them, such as, for example, schizophrenia. That's the most obvious drug, uh, illness that can be treated now pharmaceutical, pharmaceutically. All right. Having said all that, in the 1940s, the French modern artist Jean de Buffet, along with some of his pals like André Breton, the head of the Surrealists, and various writers and painters and poets, there always has to be a poet in this gang, uh, in the late 40s in Paris were sharing their ideas about the kinds of unusual art forms they were encountering in their research and their travels. Dubuffet, in particular, explored certain countries of Western Europe 
Switzerland, France, Germany, uh, Belgium to some degree, and started collecting art by people who were self-taught. They had not gone to art school. They were often living on the margins of society, mainstream society, either by choice or by the force of circumstances in their lives, poverty or whatever it might have been. And he began collecting these artworks. He is the one in 1945 who came up with the term art brut, in French, raw art, literally raw art. There is a long-standing joke among art brut historians, which is this. It's kind of in the margins. But Jean Dubuffet was born and brought up in Le Havre, you know, the port city on the Atlantic coast of France. His family was in the wine wholesaling business. You've heard of Champagne Brut, right? Uh, it is quite possible that he's having a big joke on all of us by naming, by coming up with this term Art Brut, because there's a reference in there to the Champagne, to the winemaking that, with which his family was commercially involved. But in any case, Brut means raw, right? So why raw? Because he chose the word, because it, it, it refers to the unfiltered, unfettered, raw creative power or creative energy that resides somewhere in the human psyche. Now, of course, today, neurosurgeons, neuroscientists are very busy trying to plot exactly where in the brain creativity resides and how creativity is expressed with, from an understanding of biochemistry. That didn't exist in the time of Dubuffet in the 40s. So fast forward. Dubuffet uh, began collecting this work that he called Arbrut. Among the people who were making it were people in psychiatric hospitals, but not exclusively, and people in prisons, people living in small villages that, as I said, were on the margins of the societies uh, uh, in which they lived, the local eccentric, for example. And uh, by the time in the, mid, in the early 70s, he had amassed about 5,000 works of art of this kind. And he was looking for a home for this material. And he, uh, he, he said quite, quite pointedly that he did not want it to reside in France. He didn't think the French could understand it. So he had friends in Switzerland. And he thought, well, you know, Switzerland, very conservative, buttoned up place, but they did create Dada in Zurich. <laughs> So he reached out to his friends, but including. I mean, but, but, but was also Switzerland was uh, very instrumental also in the in the construction of Albert, no? By yes, his encounter I'm, with Boldly. Yes, I'm going to. Yes, I'm, 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 I'm about to tell you that. Um, so he reached out to his friends in uh, Switzerland. Yes, uh, we'll get back to Boldly in a moment, and made an offer of his collection. That he, for which he was looking for a home. And it just so happened that the city of Lausanne in the early 70s had an empty 18th century chateau up on the hill, which made a perfect home for this collection. And the, the museum, the Collection de la Brute, was born. It opened its doors to the public in 1976. And the 5,000, roughly 5,000 works of Dubuffet's personal collection became the core of this new museum's holdings. Today, there are roughly 70,000 pieces. So, remarkable quantity of work for a small, a relatively small museum. It's the first museum of its kind in the world. It's certainly the leading museum of its kind in the world. It acts as the custodian of the legacy of Art Brut, but it's, an, it's, a, it's not one of those museums that is a, a, a keeper of a stagnant kind of art. I have to say, whoever hasn't been to the Museo de la Brut in Lausanne should take a plane tomorrow now, and go. Right now. <laughs> And I'm wearing my badge here. It's a fantastic here. Uh, institution. I am very proud to be uh, a member of the Ford Person uh, Advisory Council of the museum. Um, the late Roger Cardinal, who we'll mention in a moment, uh, was a British art historian who died uh, several years ago. And when Roger was uh, and nearing the end of his, his life, ready to retire from his university teaching career, he stepped down from the uh, advisory council of the museum in Switzerland and asked me to replace him, which was a tremendous honor. I grew up in Switzerland. I'm very closely linked to that country. And so in many ways, there was a nice, it was a nice fit. And I have also worked as a guest curator for the museum. So it, 
it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to be associated with this institution because of the mission that it has. And it's just the coolest museum in the world, period. There's, no one, there's nothing like it. All right, having said that, um, quickly. In 1972, Roger Cardinal was putting together a book called Outsider Art to introduce this phenomenon to the English-speaking world. His editor at the publishing company in London said, Roger, we can't use the word art brut. It's French. It's French. What can we say? The, Brit <laughs> the British will never understand it. So we need an alternative for this. And they poked around and poked around and came up with the term outsider. Let's call it outsider art because it refers to the marginal, margin, not, I don't want to say marginalized. That's a loaded ideological word. But it refers to the fact that the makers of this kind of art tend to reside on the margins of mainstream society and culture, either by choice or by, by, because of the circumstances of their lives. So the word outsider art became the title of the book, and it's stuck. Now, if I had my graphics, I would show you that outsider art and art brut are not exactly equivalent terms. All art brut, by definition, is outsider art, but not all outsider art is art brut. Why? Because outsider art, when Roger Cardinal introduced this term, <laughs> he threw more gasoline on the fire of the discussion of this, of this genre. Keep in mind, art brut and its sister category, outsider art, are art categories that are determined by the observer, not by the maker. You don't wake up in the morning and say, I'm going to make an art brut sculpture today. Well, like uh, the writer, the Argentinian writer Borges said that all literary genres are, are, you know, defined by the by the by the reader. By the reader. So, so if you want to read the Bible as a as a as a noir, or you want to read it as a sentimental novel, it's fine, you know. It's a comic book. Yes. All right. So, I take that point. But in this case, uh, let me just read to you quickly because this is very important. This will clear. This will this will really clear the air. Yeah. These are the basic criteria that Dubuffet put forth to identify an artistic creation as falling into the category of arbrut. Now, nowhere in his writings, and he wrote a lot, did he specifically sit down and in one place offer one definition. One has to look at the totality of his writings to extract from them this information, but it is there. Well, also because it was not clear to him. I mean, well, was it was, but it, he there was, was a feeling it on the go, you know, because I mean, there was a fluidity the, the, over the over the yes, years. I mean, people like Chaisak, you know, were considered at the beginning. E yes. And yes. Not, when you look at when you look at Dubuffet's writings mm -hmm. and his letters, his correspondence, we have everything, everything that Dubuffet produced that is related to his art brut research resides in the archives of the Collection La Brute in Lausanne. But all of his other work is in the custody of the Fondation de Buffet in Paris. So there's a divide between these bodies of his research. And it's very important because it's, it's over in Lausanne where we can comb through all these documents that we can begin to discern his definition and criteria making with regard to our Brut. All right? So here are these points. Number one. the Genuine art brut artist is someone who is completely self-taught as a maker of art. This person did not go to school, did not study formally at the academy. All right? Secondly, as I just said, normally these people live and work on the margins of mainstream society and culture. That does not mean that they are not people of culture. In order to be that, you'd have to be the wild child, you know, Francois Truffaut's film, The Wild Child, the, the boy who grows up in the forest. No. Almost anyone, unless you are the wild child, grows up <clears throat> with some affiliation to a culture, a tradition. So, on the margins of the mainstream. Three, the work that these people make has no conscious dialogue. It's not in conscious dialogue, intentionally in dialogue, with the canonical art history as we know it. They're making it for themselves. They're not making it in response to Picasso's nudes or Matisse's cutouts. They're waking up in the morning and making this because they're compelled to make 
whatever they make. All right, which they might not even regard as quote unquote art, because that's a notion that an educated person who understands what the meaning of art is, which as you know, has its roots in the late 19th century aesthetics of an object of supposedly beauty that resides in a kind of hermetic, conceptually hermetic space. All right, the fourth point. As a result of this art that they make not being in conscious dialogue with canonical art history, each work is a unique piece and almost a genre in its own right. Each Wolfly drawing, each body of work of an art brut artist, Alois Corba, Alois uh, Adolf Wolfly, Amini Evans, each body of work is unique unto itself. All right. Fifth point, there is a visionary character to the work made by these people. Visionary in, in a very broad sense. That vision might be, as we just heard about Minnie Evans, the expression of something deeply personal, in her case, reflection, literally an, an articulation, a tangible, visible one, of what she saw in dreams. Interestingly, as you know, I divide my time between here and Japan. In Japanese, we don't say, there is no verb to say to dream. We say, yume o miru, to see a dream which implies something cinematic, which I think is very interesting when, when we think about these artists. They're always seeing their dreams, like, you know what I mean? They're, they're, it's cinema to them almost. And then... Far away from Freud. Yeah. Not, which only dream of what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what? Sometimes a microphone really is a microphone. Okay. <laughs> so the visionary, the visionary quality of these artists, sometimes that vision has to do with their religious beliefs, sometimes with their notions of history, sometimes with a deep personal philosophy, sometimes with a, a, a vision of nature or humankind's relation to nature, etc., etc. Or with many we saw hers were uh, related to her dreams, and there was a lot of nature reference in there, powers of nature, you could see that. All right, number... Uh, the sixth point, or fifth or sixth point. This is an observation from me, not so much a defining criterion articulated by Dupuffet, but it, 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 it bubbles up to the surface in his thinking. And that is that often these artists make discoveries about how to use their materials and how to express themselves technically that are unique to themselves. We suppose a very good example downstairs. So, you know, for example, he's, he might be using embroidery, but it's how he's using the embroidery that makes it so deeply personal and unique to him. All right. And there's another point that I would add. This is a very much um, an Edward ob observation that I'm tacking on to Dubuffet's criteria. And this is very important. And this is not to belittle our friends like yourself who have gone to art schools and have degrees in the making of art and the history of art and make art uh, informed by all of your knowledge of what art is and has been. But here's the big distinction. When these artists that we thought, think of as outsider artists, art boot artists, self-taught artists in the broadest sense, keep in mind that self-taught is such a broad term that it includes folk art, folk art makers. But folk art makers are not art boot artists because folk art is rooted in traditions. Well, neither outsider, no? Well, say that again? Neither no, outsider, outsider art neither technically neither is not folk art. Yes. All right, but here's the observation. These artists wake up and they're making what they make, not because they want to, but because they have to. It is as essential to them as breathing. And so that's the big distinction. Well, I, I many times they're associated as kind of like a, a mandate outside themselves, you know, in the case yeah. of... Bispo's yeah. Osario, but many yeah. other people. So Bispo's like, a very good Tarpa example. San, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the aliens si. and, you know, so on, si, si. on and on and on. Yeah. It's always after kind of like epiphany with a, some kind of like a right. force beyond themselves. That they yes. So that sense of being compelled with great urgency to have to make this, mm -hmm. this, their work is, in my opinion, I think it comes through in the work, in the spirit of the work. I think it is, is, is can be felt. This is not the case with a Jeff Koon sculpture or a Damien Hurt dot painting. Those guys wake up in the morning, they have literally staffs of hundreds of people who just churn it out. It's product for an art market. It's valid as product. I'm not, I'm not dismissing it as, as invalid as a, as a form of artistic expression. It doesn't interest me at all. Okay, 
And then the last one, the last point, the last point I want to make is that, and this is a very important point. This is again an Edward observation, but it's something that needs to be reinforced over and over again. Art brut and outsider art is not the art of the mentally ill. It is not a, uh, a job requirement that you be mentally ill or affected by mental illness in order to be qualified, uh, classified as I an mean, art brute. One classic, one classic example is uh, Anton Agarto, you know, mm -hmm. who of course was, you know, mm -hmm. visited by Dubuffet, mm -hmm. but you know, mm -hmm. he, he kind of excluded him mm -hmm. from the from yeah. the from the art yeah. brute. So, so I just want to, I just want to say that. It's not and enough to qualify. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to say that is basically mm. the. Th that is the list of def defining criteria that we that we need to go forward in this discussion. So, adelante. Yes. So adelante is now that you came up with all the this. Why were you actually inclined to that? What was your path? The path that led to to Lausanne. To oh. The why were you inclined? That's as a good a question. Critic to the all right. to the abut? Well, curiously, um, I grew up in Switzerland in the capital Bern which is in the German-speaking region, and my parents were American diplomats. My mother was from Mexico City. She became a naturalized gringa. And uh, so we were, they were based in the American embassy in Bern. Small city, very quiet. And I'm old city enough. City where Wolfley works. What's that? Where Adolf Wolfley works. Yes, and Adolf Wolfley was born in a village in the Bern Oberland region, yeah, yeah, and then uh, grew up closer to the city. and. Um, the psychiatric hospital in which he spent the latter half of his life was, is located in the outskirts of Bern. Today, the archive that holds all of, almost all of Wolfley's artistic production is in the Kunstmuseum Bern. And, it's a, and there's a, if you should ever visit Bern, and this beautiful museum has a really good uh, collection of, of, of his work, there is a room that's dedicated to him with a changing exhibition all the time. It's on, appropriately enough, Hodler Strasse, Hodler, you know, the great modern Swiss painter. So, um, and for many years, for many decades, the Paul Klee Foundation was housed in the Kunstmuseum too. But more than 15 years ago, it moved up to a building up on the hill overlooking the city in a beautiful Renzo Piano building that looks like a giant wave. And uh, so that's, because Klee was, Klee lived in Bern for many years. So, Bern is a was quiet city, but... was influenced by Abut as well. Yeah, very much. I mean, so. But I, 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 I grew up, I grew up in Bern, and I, I think I was exposed. I think I saw Wolfley for the first time when I was a young teenager there, and uh, yeah, I noticed on your notes you mentioned the so late. Was to Wolfley that you actually were interested in Abut? Was it first? I, I think I was introduced to Abut uh, by me Wolfley. As well, but not to see it in Bern. I only saw it when I was a teenager, but I saw it in the library of my father. The Dubuffet in books? Cahiers. No, the Dubuffet. Oh, okay. Tala. The modern okay. book, you know. Yes, I had the, I had slides in, of all this in the, in the presentation. Case. You're not going to see. <laughs> but it's good. You just describe the slides and we imagine yeah. it. <laughs> so 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 when I was a, a, a youngster in Bern and I learned about this kind of art, I poked around and, and learned more about it. It was a few years after my family left Switzerland that the museum opened in Lausanne. So isn't it interesting that all these years later I should be so closely associated with that place? I was recently reading um, uh, the notes of um, oh of a, of an artist I'm writing about for my magazine and a, a woman an older woman and in her remark she says uh, something about not believing that things just happen in the world but things happen with a sense of purpose and destiny that's very interesting that I should eventually be back in Switzerland the way I Talk am. Talk about your magazine, the journal. Brute I mean, journal? You've been an editor, of course, of yes. you know, well, vision and so on, okay. but what, what, what was the thing right. to actually carry your own okay. journal? Yeah. Well, in the summer of 1919, uh, in uh, 2021, during the pandemic, along with a, a team, an international team of collaborators, uh, artists, photographers, uh, arts journalists, and some, and, and some artist correspondents, such as uh, Kathy Ward in London, who's a brilliant painter and uh, very well connected. She knows everyone. You couldn't be better. As an editor, that's the kind of reporter you want. She knows everyone. And uh, I decided to, to, after many years at Raw, at Raw Vision, to create a new magazine because I wanted to do something that has, hasn't been done in this field. 
and that is to look at the work of self-taught artists, art put artists, outsider artists, in a broader art historical and deeper critical context. And so in a very cheeky way, our masthead says, uh, Brut Journal, Art Brut, Outsider Art, the unclassifiable, and the avant-avant-garde. Adelante. Adelante. Okay. So what we're doing is talking about it's these... It's a military word. Si, Okay, so avanti. So, it's a, it's so obrigado. So, so we, we want to look at all of these things, all these topics, in, in dialogue with each other, because this is normally not done. It's done all the time when you're looking at modern art, contemporary art, but it's not, it's not done in this field. Instead, traditionally, the emphasis when looking at the work of a, an art boot or outsider artist is always on biography, biography, biography. So, so as a result, there's not enough discussion of the technique, uh, the use of materials, and how these aspects of an artist, uh, I don't like to use an artist, I don't use the word practice. Dentists and lawyers have practices. Artists make things. Um, so how what artists make uh, relate to what other artists make and have made and have thought and have done. That discussion hasn't been ta happening, so we're, we're doing it. And it's very exciting because the readers are responding to this sensibility. It's very exciting. So for example, in an article I might be talking, or my, one of my other writers might be talking about um, a particular outsider artist painting, and if the and if the affinity is appropriate, we'll then discuss maybe someone in 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 the cubist from the cubist period or from the minimalist art minimalist art period or from the conceptual art period. We did a whole issue several months ago on conceptual art. Why? Because we were looking at how conceptual art's legacy is still being felt today. It's still as radical in some ways as it was when it first came on the scene in the, in the 1960s. So that's why I'm doing the magazine. That's good. Uh, we will go back to this okay. topic again of the, of the you know, comparisons okay. between contemporary art and so on. But Hi. I want to talk about Bispo before okay. that. Uh, you know, of course, I mean, I, I mean, the encounter with Bispo's work for me in 1997 in the psychiatric hospital was one of the biggest epiphanies of my life. I mean, I, I basically can only compare to the work of Faso Bolfli, Dagger, Martin Ramirez, and Alois in terms of the kind of, you know, strength of the work and the, yes. and the uh, because, because he had the capacity, he had the, you know, he had the time and he had the, somehow he managed to have the means to, to make this incredible body of work of near a thousand objects. So I want to see how do you, how do you see how Bispo Don Osayo's work fits into these definitions of output, into the context of output, how do you how do you see it in relationship to, right. for instance, to other artists okay. and so on? So. Well, if we look, yeah, like that. You, you are publishing an article now on Bispo Don Osayo in After All, which is yes. coming out yes. very soon in the yes. journal. There's a there's a British journal. magazine, which is a kind of an academic journal, but not stuffy, <laughs> and it's called After All. It's published by. Uh, Central St. Martin School of Art, which is now a division of the University of London. And that magazine is coming out any minute, as we speak, could be issued. Uh, it's, I, I love this magazine because they fit to me in a cover. Okay. So. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so they asked me, to, they, asked me they, they, they have a, an issue coming out, their next issue, and they've at, they asked me to write an article about Bispo in this issue. And it was very interesting. When the editor commissioned the article, he sent me... Um, an explanation, a, a so-called brief. I thought it was very CIA-like to receive a brief. I'd never received a brief for an article. But he said, this is what the overall theme of the issue will be. We're looking at uh, certain art forms, certain artists' works from a neo-colonialist point of view, blah, blah, blah. Lots of postmodernist jargon talks about spaces, sites, strategies, contextualization, recontextual. Don't get me started on doctrinaire postmodernist jargon, all right? <laughs> I will destroy it. Uh, it's tiresome, it's tedious, it's ideologically heavy, it's loaded, and it's completely inappropriate to a discussion of art boot and outsider art. So having said that, I said to him, I said to the editor, you know, respectfully, I said, I'm not going to go down that path with you. I'm not going to 
position Bispo as you know some poor black man in a in a psychiatric hospital victim of neo colonial colonial and neo colonial and post colonial uh, uh, circumstances. He was no one's victim, and once you start put as Joan, the great painter Joan Mitchell once said, speaking about art critics, this is a direct quote, look it up. Once you put the blah, blah, blah on it, you kill it. <laughs> so, uh, so with Bispo, once you victimize him and say that, he, that, that his work must be looked at and examined and analyzed through the filter of postmodernist mumbo jumbo post-colonialist ideological discourse, you kill it. He was no one's victim. And to use a buzzword that is mana to the postmodernist agency, you also eliminate his agency. And the proof is in the film you're showing downstairs. The film demonstrates vividly the creative, the raw creative, un, un, unbridled creativity, creative energy of this man. He could not not create. And it's, it, just listen to him talk. So, to answer your question, why, how, how does his work, body of work relate to Art Brut? It, as our British cousins say, ticks all the boxes. <laughs> Every one of the criteria I just cited applies to his work, or vice versa. His work applies to these criteria. Every one. So it's classic no, Art Brut. No, but I was talking more in terms of what you your understanding of this, like a formal structure, you know, that's like how you could actually compare its work. He, oh, to to other, in others? To other oh, I practices. see. Yeah, yeah other practices? Yeah, to other bodies of work? Yes. Um, well, I, okay, I have, I have actually some specific answers. Number one, here's a, here's a very good one, a very, very relevant and vivid one. In my opinion, Adolf Wolfley is one of the greatest of the great art brute, uh, definitive art brute makers. His work is so rich, so complex, that he is Bach, Miles Davis, James Joyce, all rolled into one, and more. I can think of more artists of complexity whose work, works are rich and complex. You know, we're, we need another 50 years to figure out Finnegan's Wake, right? We need another 50 years to figure out the blue notes of Miles Davis's trumpet playing. We need... Right, <laughs> right. Uh, piano, yes. No, one of these Wolfly numbers, you know, yes. eight, eight so, years. Yes, two, yes. Two, so, two, for two, example, two, this is, here, let me give you a, a, a direct, vivid relationship between Wolfly and Bispo. Wolfly believed, and he expressed in the 45 volumes of his handmade giant illustrated books, that he was the creator of the universe, that his alter ego, whom he named Saint Adolf II yes. was the creator of the universe. And so all of his vast body of work is the, is the story, is the narrative, like a biblical story, it is the narrative of Saint Adolf, Adolf II's creation of the universe. Does this sound familiar? Yeah, Bispo. In a, well, in a cosmic, yeah. They yes. Have in a cosmic yes. So Bispo, Bispo does, does something very similar. He's he, assuming that he's the incarnation of the historical Jesus Christ and of the religious Jesus Christ. He believes that it's his mission to recreate all of material creation in preparation for the Christian so-called Judgment Day, right? Yeah. That was a vast undertaking. No, but also the similarity in terms of the accumulation of data, you know? Yes, the yes, with yes. The numbers and calculations. You know, with, yes, in yes. And with this but, kind of long listing that yes. also, you know, also Bispo does. Yes, to some degree. His, However, you know, encyclopedic. Yes. Day, However, yeah. Wolfley's use of numbers is very different from Bis Bispo's use of, yeah, uh, no, of texts. Yes, well. both mm -hmm. of them, both they, they, yes, they were both very interested in geography, both are that's true. Yeah, both yeah. Are, I mean, the, geography yeah. is one of the yeah. books of, uh, mm -hmm. one of the books yeah. of, of well, one place yes. in geography. You know? Some of the affinities that I wanted to point out visually with slide accompaniment uh, between Bispo and other art brute and outsider artists include, for example, when you look at the, uh, the banners, the Bispo banners, which have the embroidered texts, there are many, many um, 
good examples in the world of art brut and outsider art of artists who integrate text and images together. Uh, and you'll see like the American Jesse Howard, the black American J.B. Murray, uh, the American uh, Howard Finster even in his paintings, uh, Wolfley, many of the Europeans. Um, someone like Carlo Zinelli had a, an imaginary writing, or maybe it wasn't so imaginary, maybe it meant something to Zanelli, but we can't decipher what his Nanetti, Nanetti on the hospital yes. walls as well. Yes, 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 yes. So the, the idea of the text being uh, not only um, a communicative didactic tool for these artists to actually say something, convey messages through text, through words, but also for me, for me as a, as a graphic designer by training, I see these elements in their compositions and I find them to be so fascinating because they function as, as graphic elements in compositions. They're beautiful as such. They can be appreciated just as they are without even knowing what the texts are saying. Yes. Muito one one of, of the other things that's uh, common in, in certain uh, artists as well is the, the fabrication of costumes, no? Yes. I mean, you have that, yes, uh, you see that. Artist, what's his name? Uh, famous making the, his costumes and, you know, wear them on yes. the streets. Yes, uh, Well, speaking of which, the, uh, this is a plug for a friend and very active participant in the Outsider Art Fair. The Japanese art dealer Yukiko Koide is coming to be in the fair this time, and she's bringing work by a really interesting artist, Nana Yamazaki whom I included in the show that I did for the Collection de la Brute in 2018 of Art Brut from Japan. And this young woman re repurposes found garments in ways that you cannot imagine. They become sculptural objects from, an outer, from outer space. They're beautiful. So I hope that you have a chance to see Nana Yamazaki's work at the Koide booth. That's good. So, okay. okay. We, we, adelante. Si, sí, adelante. <laughs> Uh, you know, w going back to this notion of like, I mean, the beast put on Osayo as many other artists, uh, you know, at the margins, you know, or so called associated with outside art or art, but don't consider the work art, you know. How could we actually, you know, see these works now in terms of the opacity, you know, in terms of the sort of lack of intentionality, you know? I mean, in the sense that, you know, uh, let's say a painter, especially today, you know, or a conceptual artist, completely aware of the context how his work is going to be understood or read, you know. But we are confronted by a series of objects, you know, that were not made to be in exhibition spaces. Okay, I, so, I understand I mean, your question. To, for this basic okay. sort of spatial condition, but also conceptually in the sense that this works, for instance, I mean, I see Bispil and Osayos as a single work, not as a, not as a separate works. Like I see yes, I did too. Endeavor as one yes. piece, you know. And, and, and all right, well, we, we try, for instance, in the exhibition, I mean, as much as we can, because the fertility of the objects to actually present them close to the way that they were presented in the cell where he, yes, he yes. uses studio, you know, as um, as President Nixon used to say in his press conferences, when he was asked a particularly interesting question, let me say this about that. <laughs> okay, I have a few things to say about this. So number one, I agree with you. It is almost imperative to, to look at Bispo's work as a totality, as an ensemble. Yes, we can appreciate the individual works, but it's, it, is, it is important to keep in mind that he saw them, because he tells us, we know that, in his statements, that he viewed this artistic creativity uh, as a totality, as an, as a, as an oeuvre, as, a, as an ensemble. Second, we can never second guess any artist's intention. If the artist is, comes on the, goes on the record in a diary, in an interview, in, in a public statement, expressing why he or she made a particular work, then we have to take on face value what that maker says his or her intention was. But in many cases, with art brut and outsider artists, we do not have such records of specific explicit statements of intention. I think it's a mistake to try to psychoanalyze any artist through the work. Now, in the history of this field of art roots, as I said, it goes back to the late, 19, to late 1800s and the beginnings of the treatment of patients in what we now think of as psychiatric hospitals. In those days, they were called mental asylums or worse. And 
going into the early 20th century, psychiatrists would very often use the, the artistic creations, I'm choosing my words very carefully, I didn't say work of art, but the artistic creations of their resident patients for diagnostic purposes. So those objects, drawings, paintings, weavings, ob uh, sculptures, that such psychiatric patients produced, could they, should they have been regarded as works of art? That is to say, productions of aesthetic quality and value? You know, what if they were produced for diagnostic purposes? So, it, again, it is we, the observers, who designate someone's creation as qualifying as arbut or not. So I don't, I don't really like to second guess the, un, the unstated intention of any arbut or outsider art maker. We do have on the record from Bispo one small statement that is actually a large statement when he says explicitly that the work he made was his version of a recreation of the material world of his God's creation that he believed he needed to produce in preparation for his religion's judgment day. So we have that. We had that. And as, as actually claiming that this was not art. Yeah. But at the same time, we, he did not have a problem of other people showing this as art. You know? That's right. And I do but find it quite interesting. It, yeah, that he it, allowed them to yes, be shown. Yes, so. in the film, it, you have to pay very close attention, in the film downstairs in the exhibition, he is asked if he regards his productions as art. And he says no, which means, or it implies, that he had an understanding of what art meant. Very interesting, because n many of the art brute makers about whom we have some reliable documentation did not regard what they were doing as art. If you come to think, you know, many, many of the pieces that we regard today as art were not conceived as art pieces, you know? Say that again? Many of the pieces that we regard, or cultural objects that we regard today as art... Oh, that's true. ...were not that's really true. conceived that's true. That's as, true. As, as, as art in terms mm -hmm. of the... Yeah. So of uh, Western notions yes. of what art is, yes. no? I mean, there are many affinities that, uh, again, I, I wish I could have shown you these photographs, but there are many affinities that I recognized as an art historian, as an art critic, looking, looking at Bispo. Let me just throw out a few ideas for you quickly. Mm -hmm. In the, uh, I, already, I already referred to the text elements in the banners and how we find text integrated into compositions of many other art brute artists, but we also find that sometimes in the work of modern and contemporary artists. All right, in the room that has the sculptural works hanging on the wall in which boots and hats and yeah, other things are... He, they call it the vitrines, no? He yes, call it the vitrines. vitrines. The vitrine objects in which objects are repeated. Where do you see this? You see this throughout modern art. Yeah. You know, think of the French artist Armand. I brought a, I had a picture of his, from 1992, yeah. his many, many, many typewriters. That guy never saw something he didn't want to duplicate. But I mean, the intentions, that's where, where I go back, because I mean, morphological, you know, uh, similarities don't mean actually the same intentions, you know? No, 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 but I, that's I not what I'm, that I'm not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm suggesting, as an art historian and as a critic, that these affinities, formal, technical, are interesting. That's all I'm saying. They're interesting. For example, yes. look, I had another. I had another picture from the Tate Modern. There, Tate, Tate in London has uh, owns a uh, 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 Maryland diptych from 1962. Warhol. It's a very, very large two-panel yeah. diptych with a grid of repeated Marylands, Maryland faces. Yeah. Well, the repetition in Bispo in the in his vitrine object works downstairs. There it is. It's all, it's all over modern and contemporary art. Repetition, grids, Saul Lewitt drawings. It's, it's everywhere. So that's another interesting affinity. Well, but you, you could also say that, you know, if you actually are, are doing a catalog of everything existing in the planet, you're going to assemble a lot of artists as well. Did artists I hear someone say intersectionality? No, no, existing. I know, I'm joking. Oh, no, I, I just, 
a microphone sometimes. Everything, microphone. everything connects. No, I mean, it is connects because, I mean, if you had the underwood, you know. It's getting very the zen. The bicycle wheel. The conversation taking I mean, the a bicycle, turn toward the, the zen. The bicycle wheel of Bispo is obviously not related to the bicycle wheel of the Sham, yeah. except that they are both bicycle wheels. I mean, uh, they're both bicycle wheels, but, but uh, uh, an affinity but is, is, is an, uh, it doesn't have to go beyond being an affinity. That's fine. Uh, but it goes back to this question, the, the question I have, you know, which is one, one of the main things, you know. Tell me. Is the exhibitions from the past, you know, and okay. the present that have paired modern contemporary art side by side. Okay. With our books, you know. Yes, I mean, this, can, this, I will this start my, my list, of course, with Harald Seaman, you know. Harald Seaman, 1972 and, documenta. Yes, the tendency towards the Sankunstberg in 1983, ambitionary Switzerland in 1991 in the Swiss Kunsthaus, both by Seaman, you know, which is kind of led you know, pretty much the, the school of, of this curatorial practice of mixing outside the art, you know, or output with contemporary art, okay. you know. So I mean, you could also look at the roots of that in Entertete Kunst as well. Which in is whom? Entertete Kunst. Oh, okay. The, the, the infamous degenerate art. Yes, degenerate art. The Nazis, which yes. is the, one, the first one that actually does, as far as I know, this pairing of, yes. you know, yes. exhibition of pairing of okay. both. Uh, all right, so since you know, parallel visions for, for instance, 1992, yes, 1972, 90, Magic Sense of Terror, up to the new, you know, the Encyclopedic Palace in the Venice Biennale by Massimiliano Gioni, and you know, Outliers in America, Vanguard Art uh, by Lincoln yes. in 2018. Okay. So All right. what, what is your take on All right. this? I, I, this I, I'm glad you're asking me. I, I, obrigado. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, muito. Obrigado. Because I had prepared something to say on exactly this point. Mm. Uh, the, the, the esteemed Andrew Edlin, who is here tonight, he's in the house, has heard me say this before. And I'm gonna he's still here. He's yes, still yes here. he's still here. <laughs> I am going to say it again. And here it is. So you, uh, Javier, just mentioned five or six exhibitions of historical importance because in these exhibitions, dating back to 1972, the late Swiss curator Harald Seemann, in 1972, a documenta in West Germany, then West Germany, showed an exhibition of Otto Wolfli works for the first time in decades. Wolfli died in 1930, was basically forgotten. And it was thanks to it was yeah. It was very. It was thank, thanks to um, Harold Seymour showing Wolfley in 1972 a documenta that suddenly the international art world discovered or rediscovered this this artist. Okay. Anyway, these exhibitions all share a, a characteristic, which is that they put the work of self-taught art brut or outsider artist on display next to the work of trained modernists and contemporary artists. Now, that's fine, but there's also a problem with it, and it's a big one. And it's the implicit message that is conveyed primarily by the media covering these exhibitions, not so much by the makers of the exhibitions themselves, although they are sometimes at fault of the following transgression. And that is the suggestion that somehow the positioning, the placement, the display of the work of uh, the art brute and outsider artist next to, in proximity to that of the schooled modernist and contemporary artist, somehow legitimizes their creation, somehow validates them. And I would say, no, it's the other way around. You put a Coons, or I'm just using him because he, let's whippy, he, let him be the whipping boy. But let's, let's say you put a Coons or some other you know, contemporary art product made for the market in the same room with Wolfley, Bispo, the best of the best of the art brute creators. The authenticity, the genuineness, the power, the unmistakable energy of those works will blow the others out of the room. They legitimize the other work, not the other way around. They don't need to be legitimized. So, for example, G uh, Gioni's 19, 2013 Venice Biennale exhibition was written up all over the art press, 
precisely every single article was written from the point of view of that exhibition legitimizing the art brute and outsider art that was in the mix. It was insufferable to the point that at the end of 2013, in its year-end roundup article, the New York Times headline was, 2013, the year outsider art came in from the cold. <laughs> no, the only thing that came in from the cold was the ignorance of the person who wrote it who should have known better. <laughs> so this is, what, this is what we're up against. I'm saying this because this is what those of us who are proponents and advocates of the work of the uh, outsider artists and, and art brute artists, this is what we're up against. Now, yeah, yeah. so that's, that's that. Now, now I remember an evening. Boy, that was, <clears throat> that was the last word on that, wasn't it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> In parallel visions, I remember something that was very interesting. They have a different label they use actually for the work. So you had a label, you know, that was like whatever color, you know, for the for the, for the artwork, and another label for oh, yes. Schnabel or yes, Basquiat yes, yes, or whatever. So, the, so this different kind of colors thing. sometimes. So it was like a color coding, you know, the, the I know. difference. And I, I mean, I can't help but I mean to associate again to the idea of Entertete Kunst to pair, you know, modern art with with artwork, you know. Yeah. As a kind of a, I was this basic kind of two slides, you know, a method, you know, of our history, you know, of comparing two things, you know, because more, morphological. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but my question is, do you believe actually there's a way to do that? There's to do a what? way to to show our boot next to yes, non absolutely, boot. absolutely. It's how, it's how would you do it? What what is the what, you, what you, do you see? What do you see the the mistake of of uh, of Benes Biennale on our side in terms of what the way how it should be done? Again, I wasn't criticizing the Venice Biennale presentation. I was, okay. presenting, I was criticizing the way it was received. Ah, okay. I see. I see. It's a big distinction. Um, the answer to your question is to, as, one, as, as, a, as a curator or historian should do with any subject, and that is to present the work in a manner that is respectful of the work, that, goes, that, that starts with the work, not with imposing a critical framework on the work. Which leads me to the, the, the last point I really want to make on tonight's bully pulpit is this. <laughs> this is very important. Any work of art that is any good, that is doing its job, is going to communicate what it wants and needs to say effectively. It doesn't need a mile of wall text written in po po doctrinaire postmodernist jargon explaining it. All right? Number one. Number two. And these art, work, art brute and outsider artworks don't never come with that attachment. They don't need it. They don't need it. They're radiating an energy that is so powerful you're, you can't help but, uh, but, 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 but be touched but by they, it. But they need a conceptualization, you will agree, because I mean, for instance, to, Cons see, to see dagger drawings. No, you know, no, they don't. It, I disagree. To, no, and not to see the text. No, I disagree. Or to see Borfley without. No, uh, that, that's text. not contextualization. You know, that's just presenting the. No, no, that, yes, hey, yes, hang on, hang yes. on. Contextualization means providing a context in which to view the object on display. It's not necessary. The work will speak for itself. The only thing you need to do in the case of presenting Wolfley to a non German speaking audience is perhaps translate the texts that are visible so that an English speaking audience can understand the texts. Well, or, no, and or, then, or the text from the, from the whole book. I mean, not the whole book, you cannot put the whole book there. No, but I'm... But you have to tell the story as you oh, tell. Yes, of San course. Adolf and so on. Yes. Because otherwise you wouldn't yes. not actually... Yes, but, but I don't... You know, I, that's, that is, that's, that's just basic didactic yes, presentation yes. of information. Yes, yes. That's not imposing any critical framework on it. Yeah. Whereas if you go on and, cre and impose a critical framework on it, oh. you would put the work and say something like, you know, Otto Wolfley, uh, you know, um, prisoner of a psychiatric hospital, was speaking for all, you know, in, in, interned people uh, in, in making this work that expresses, you know, it's putting the blah, blah, blah on it. And I'm an art critic. I don't want to do that. I want to present scientifically. By the way, my colleagues in Europe much more often use, the ter use, use, use terms like scientifique to present information, you know, des infos scientifiques, scientifiques about the work, because it is scientific. If we're going to be good at what we do, we have to be somewhat detached from it. Or if you are going to present something imposing a critical framework on it, put your cards on the table and say, I'm coming from doctrinaire postmodernism, or I'm coming from Marxist 
critical theory or I'm coming from feminist critical theory, put your cards on the table. American, American creators don't do that very often. It's very disingenuous. So as a result, you walk through, you know, the Whitney Museum is a classic example, and the didactic texts are loaded with ideological uh, uh, terms. Go to the work, which, here's my bully pulpit. Well, allow me this. I'm, this is scripture now. <laughs> All good work, as I said, if it's any good, will... Did someone just say preach? Okay. Uh, all good work of art, if it's any good, will communicate what it wants and needs to say effectively. However, there's something else. Any good work of art, inevitably, unstoppably, is going to reveal its own truth. That's what we should be looking for. That is what Bispo's work is all about. It is, it is an open heart of revealed truth about what? About what it means to be human. About the unstoppable power of the human spirit and of the creative urge of the human spirit. That's Bispo. It's, it's, it's so big that it's creeping up through the floorboards. And our job, I think, as viewers of art or people who care about art, and certainly as historians and critics and curators who present art, should be to help the art reveal its truth. Let's look for it and let's help it reveal its truth because it's there. And furthermore, again, I, I, uh, I'm here to bludgeon postmodernist critical theory, not to bury it, because, because it did, in its heyday, open great doors of understanding. It did. But there are inherent limits and dangers in the application of what I call doctrinaire postmodernist critical theory. That's the kind that lets no air in the room except for the thinking posited by postmodernist, that postmodernist critical thinking, which is always relative. There are no absolute values. Nothing is absolute to the postmodernist observer, right? Everything's relative. Your truth is relative to my truth, if, even though we're talking about the same thing. And we've seen how this dangerously becomes distorted by, uh, you know, the neo-fascists in a country like this one, who have, not strategically, not consciously, but simply because the ideas are in the air, they're in the popular discourse, they're in the culture now for 40 plus years. So, now we're in this moment of so-called post-truth. This is frightening. And it's all because of, it's, it's largely because of the ideas of, the relativist ideas percolating up from postmodernist critical theory. I wrote uh, an essay that I'm very proud of about the painter Stephanie Brody Liederman, an American older painter. And in it, I explained that Stephanie Brody Liederman's work is, there's no guile, there's no manipulation. It's pure emotional, psychological energy in her paintings. And there's a, there's a, there's a paragraph in there, when I, and it says, you know, postmodernist critical theory, basically, you know, I'll save you that $150,000 that you really didn't want to spend on the Yale MFA. Here it comes. <laughs> postmodernist critical theory basically asserts that the meaning of anything, a, a, a speech, a, a film, a story, a work of art, an event, etc., a political gesture, etc., the meaning of anything depends on the experience of the person perceiving that event, whatever it might be, and the interpretation of the event, or whatever the work might be, of the person bringing his or her cultural and other kinds of experience to that experience. And therefore, it's always going to be, it favors the observer. Post, to, be, to be fair, and, to, and it's good, postmodernist critical thinking favors the observer. However, if everything is relative, and if there's no absolute value, meaning no absolute truth about anything, then everything is always relative. And that leads to a dangerous cul-de-sac of nihilism and death. It was certainly non-relative for Bispo or Adolf Wolf, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, talking about this era of post post truth I mean, what, what do you think actually of this boom, which is like a recent boom of Albert and outside the How are we doing for time? In terms yeah? Oh, we'll leave. I'll just answer his last question. In terms of, 
in terms okay. of the you yeah. know the market and we'll and social. You. I mean, uh, basically, to make into a question, what do you think of actually non scholars or non you know non specialists working with Abud? You know, well, that's, which is he, what he, is happening today. You he know? just asked me about so-called non-specialists working with art and outside art. I, don't, I can't really comment on that, but I can very quickly say to you, he, he, Javier mentioned that there's what he perceives as a boom. I don't know if I would call it a boom, but it is true that certain very well-established galleries, shall we, uh, and institutions, but I'm concerned more about the galleries right now, uh, are, are getting their hands in contemporary art galleries, very well funded galleries are now beginning to show and sell this kind of work. I have nothing against that. It's fine. Again, if it's presented in a manner that is honest and fair to the work.